At 28 years old, I was shot and paralyzed from the chest down. I had two options. I could stop, and other things I cannot control, control me. Or I could move forward and put my energy into things that would improve my life and those around me. I chose to move forward and surround myself with risk takers, innovators, and leaders who've chosen the same path. Join us on the journey. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Forward with me, Derek Herrera. Today's guest is Nick Jones. Nick Jones is a Marine Raider. He's a husband. He's a Navy Cross recipient, and now serves as a nonprofit leader for Talon's Reach Foundation. Recently, just a few weeks ago, he was awarded the Navy Cross, which to put into context, is the second highest award given for valor and bravery on the battlefield. And he was awarded this medal, this, this Navy Cross, because of his actions and his ability to continue to put others' needs ahead of his own while, while sustaining injuries, severe injuries, uh, personally, on the battlefield in Iraq in 2020. And so we talk a lot about that story and he opened up and told us amazing details about what he was thinking at that time and how he tried to solve some of the most seemingly insurmountable challenges and problems that he'd ever been confronted with on the battlefield on that day. He's a true American hero. He is incredibly humble. And I'm certain you'll enjoy this episode where we talked about some of the amazing lessons he's learned, including things like what it was like to be around people and see them struggling with adversity and trauma, how compartmentalization of traumatic events can be good or bad, depending upon the circumstance and how you choose to frame the events that have happened and how to let go of grief and guilt and to move forward with your life and your next mission. If you have any questions about the podcast, please feel free to contact me forward at DerekCarrera.com or you can fill out the contact form on our website com. You can also message me directly on Instagram or LinkedIn. And lastly, if you enjoy this podcast, I humbly request you consider leaving a review and rating because if you do, it'll help us to reach new audiences and more people who may be able to benefit from these lessons learned from such amazing people. And so thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to sharing this episode with you. So we, it was only two months. I think we were two months in, maybe two and a half months. And we were tasked with a large operation. At To this point, we maybe had gone on five, six operations, all very low key. A few engagements with local people, some sort of other um, kind of like pop-up engagements with other like local police. But to this point, zero contact, uh, very, very relaxed. And then we get tasked with this mission and immediately it, it changes because now we have real intel. We have a real large target area. And, you know, without going into too many details on planning, there was a lot of people involved. Um, it had been planning for maybe five weeks up to this point. They had been watching this area, so they knew that there was quite a bit of reliable information on who was there um, until the day before we're going in on this mission. Um, they had been watching it and watching it. As far as we knew, there was only seven bad dudes that were supposed to be on the objective. That night when you know we're prepping, the numbers start raising. We kept going into the uh, into the command area, and we would go in there, and I would look at the the updates for the mission, and it would be like now there's twelve guys, now there's thirteen. It got all the way up to seventeen, maybe it was nineteen. It, some details are a little foggy now, but um, regardless, we still went. We ended up inserting in the morning. And I had with me a few Americans and 
about 25 Iraq partner forces, and then um, a couple other coalition forces with us. And I was in charge of basically making sure that our partner force got to where they needed to go, set in security. Um, we had just dropped thousands of pounds of bombs on each cave entrance. So we knew that we were relatively okay to move around. We had snipers in place. We had machine gunners in place. Like we had the mountain locked down from what we could see. When we landed, a few other enemy were moving around. We had some coalition forces engage those guys. So the snipers were on it. They were, they were crushing it. Um, the bombs really loosened up a lot of the ground, which made things a little bit difficult to walk. Um, just because the, everything's just crunched and dusty and, you know, what I thought was a cave entrance now looks like just a rubble wall. Um, so it, it was a little disorienting, but it was still very helpful. I am very fortunate that that happened. Um, but you know, going into it, there's, there was 19 bad guys there. There's at least one of them still alive. So we were very, very on edge walking down into these mountain ranges like man it was so steep it was insane um like there was times when i was like walking in my ruck was pulling me back and i'm like trying to make sure that i don't slide down this the the mountainside and still trying to keep my gun up and it's like man i feel like i need climbing gear for some of this stuff but it was obviously not practical um yeah but it was just wild. You look around in the mountains and you can see like rock formations where they have previous fighting positions or current fighting positions and mm. maybe not manned or just deep in there. So it was, uh, it was the most eerie feeling in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, okay. No, I mean, it's, it's intense. Yeah, it sounds like you, you know, you obviously knew generally what you were going into and prepared accordingly, right? It's not like you just waltzed in there, right? Like you had snipers, machine guns, prepped with JDAMs or aerial munitions, Absolutely. everything else. Um, you know, well prepared and well thought out. So. Yeah, we we figured that, you know, and we had the the mountains up in Mo Mosul to to help us out when we were trying to figure out how to best approach a cave and what explosives do we take? What other tools do we take? So we had everything. We had little, little cameras, little drones. We had a lot of explosives on us. So we were ready for most situations. And, <clears throat> you know, we had a very systematic way of, of how we wanted to clear these. We wanted to be very methodical and kind of take it as like a, <clears throat> an apartment, if you will, like, the way that all the caves were laid out is like, there's a way that we can do this to clear them from top down. And if we can do it that way, we can push everybody out if there's any enemy left. And we'll have the high ground the entire time until we flush everybody to the bottom. So that was our, our, our concept. Um, and then when we started going, we started, you know, working a little bit too quickly and you know, a plan never survives first contact. And as soon as there was a, a shiny object here or there, you know, like it was so easy to, to fall down a different rabbit hole. Um, and at this point, <clears throat> we had split up into uh, two different assault elements, which um, was was not intended, but it, you know, some people are taking initiative. They're doing what they felt is right. And now we, um, we split up a little bit. We weren't too far away from each other, but now my element, we're clearing these, these top caves and I'm staring into a very large cave opening with, you know, so right, right in front of me is, is a dead ISIS fighter fully kitted up, covered in mm -hmm. dust, had just been, had just been blown up but around him was a mounted machine gun in the in the wall of the cave there was bags and bags of ammo there's m16s there's ak's there's explosive devices like these guys were set they were ready um and in this moment while i'm staring at this guy 
I hear hell open up behind me. And I hear all these sporadic calls coming in that they're taking contact, that there's a casualty down. Um, and like, they just kept coming in so fast. And I, I had to stop in my tracks. I had to get security. I had to listen for a minute. And then that's when those piercing calls came through saying that an Eagle was down. And this is when things got insanely real. And, you know, you, you feel that gut drop, you feel your heart stop. And it's just like, Oh shit. Like waiting for the name to come in or whatever it is, whatever you're waiting for, you're waiting for the next steps. And then you hear another one. There's another Eagle down. And that's when I knew I was like, I got to go. I, I immediately posted security on this cave and told the Iraqis to, to continue clearing this one. And I turned and I beelined it as, as fast as I could down there. Um, passing other cave entrances, pretty stupid at the time, obviously in the, the midst of battle with the adrenaline rush that I had, I didn't care what was happening. Um, I just knew that somebody needed help. Uh, so as soon as I, I make first, first contact with these guys, with the friendly forces, I'm trying to find out as much information as I could. Um, until I hear gunfire coming down from a small ravine, I throw my ruck off and jump right in with them. Um, and now I'm, I'm side by side with the, with the coalition forces fighter. And, um, we're trying to work our way up to this cave and I see a body in front of me up there, um, trying to call to him, calling, calling and, and no response. And as I crawl up on these rocks, I peek my head over just a little bit to get a little bit more essay. And the, uh, ISIS fighters in the cave definitely, definitely saw me before I saw them and pinned us down immediately. And it's like, I mean, the cave is small or the, the ravine that we're in is pretty small, maybe a meter wide. So it was like, I could almost touch this wall, not quite close enough to get cover immediately, but I had some small rocks in front of me. So, you know, I get back down and wait for a lull and shooting as much as I could and kind of sometimes one hand gunning it because trying to maneuver on these rocks was, was definitely difficult. And that's when I see these legs fly up in the air from the guy that was on the ground. And as soon as I see these legs fly up in the air, I run up there as quick as I could. And I'm a lefty, so I, I shoot left-handed, but I'm right-handed. So I was I'm right-hand dominant. I'm a little bit stronger on this side, but I start shooting as fast as I could, emptying my mag. And I grab this dude's legs and throw him down as hard as I could down, down this hill, push him down to the coalition forces and try to like protect them and still shooting as quickly as we could. And, um, at this point I just covered them as they dragged him out. So we could at least save him. They treated him. They got to medevac him. Um, he, he survived, uh, shot through the left leg and then he got shot in the top of the head through his helmet. Uh, but luckily it only cut his hair. Really. He's got a little scar and worked out, worked out well for him on that one. Um, I, I made it out of that ravine and that's when I, you know, I was looking for those other two, two casualties. Um, I tried to gain my bearing. I tried to take a drink. I tried to do whatever I could cause I had a feeling of who it might be. Um, and I definitely didn't want to see who I thought it was. Uh, and that's when I, I finally made it up. I was talking to the support by fire to kind of walk me on cause they could see the two bodies. Um, they walked me onto the position and as I approached it, I was on top of the cave entrance now and, um, yeah, I could see my, my two teammates, they were both killed in action right below there. Uh, the team chief gunnery sergeant Diego Pongo and, uh, the executive officer, major Mo novice, Moses novice. Um, he was a captain at the time, but posthumously awarded or, uh, promoted to major. Um, and so at that time, you know, it, it definitely turned into a recovery mission. We spent the last several hours trying, fighting, pushing through, um, multiple times I reached down and through and trying to reach into the cave to chuck as many grenades in there as I could and kill the dude so I could jump down there and have a, a second to grab him and 
every time I got close to this edge and threw one in it, I was just covered in gunfire. Um, so it pushed me back every time we tried to get it like in Apache to thread a hellfire right into this cave. Not effective. 30 mic mic, not effective. Like this thing was fortified. And uh, I went up for one of my final attempts and ended up getting shot in the right leg. Um, driving me back, I, I I tried to stand on it. I tried to walk on it a little bit. It was way too painful. Uh, didn't break any bones. You know, at the time, we didn't really know what happened because it, it seemed so minuscule, but um, ended up severing my nerve. And now to this day, I can tell what nerve pain is immediately. <laughs> and that was not cool. Um, but, uh, you know, once I got hit and we were pushed back, we, we, it was hard for me to push up to a, a safe location because we didn't have a solid plan at this time on how we were going to get them. Um, little did I know that there was plans in the works. They were figuring stuff out. A special mission unit came in that night. Um, using the night to their advantage instead of us during the day, using all U.S. forces and, you know, doing it right. They went in and they got these guys out, but they had a, they had a struggle. When they got there, they ended up killing four more dudes and a suicide vest cranked off. Ended up blowing two of their operators off the top of this cave that I was standing on. Luckily, nobody else got hurt, but they brought both of our our guys home. I was able to be there. Um, I was, I was out and awake enough to, to watch them come off the bird that night. Um, and then the ramp ceremony the next morning. Uh, yeah. And then from there, it was all about recovery. Um, yeah. It, uh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It's, it's intense, amazing, you know, feat of heroism across the board from, from everybody involved. Um, and I think I know a quote for one of the things I was reading about you and you had spoken about this before you said, you know, I didn't want to quit. Right. Because those guys wouldn't quit on me. And, uh, it makes sense, right? It's like you go through all this, you work with this team, you see these guys in this situation, and you glossed over the part, but, uh, after you'd been shot, right. And, you know, we're still dealing with this. The details that I read were that, you know, you still continued to, to handle business and manage yourself till the Madivac came ensuring that there's a proper turnover and, and, and things of that nature. And so, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And then I, and so when you got back and you got airlifted out, you, you stayed there in country and just hung out for a few days before you, you evacuated or, or like, how did you? So my injury seemed minuscule enough at first sight to keep me there. They said I could be walking in, in two weeks. Um, I was optimistic. I obviously want to get back in the fight as quickly as possible. So I said, sure. They gave me crutches. They sent me home um, or sent me back to the team site. And when the two week mark came, I was like, yo, I still can't walk. I literally can't put my foot on the ground without being electrocuted. I don't know what the, what the deal is. And, you know, in, in describing all of this, they're like, yeah, it sounds like it could be nerve pain. Um, and I, you know, this, this right here was my first, um, one of my first big challenges that I had in my recovery because I had to tell the team I have to leave. I made the call on my, on my own to go seek more treatment. You know, I ne I know it needed to be done. Somebody was going to make the call for me, but I decided to do it myself. And I told him guys, like, I would love to be here with you, but I can't, I have to do this for myself. Like if one of you has to come into my room and carry me to the bunker, because somebody wants to try to bomb us, like, I'm not going to be able to move quick enough. I don't want to be a detriment to you. I don't want to be, you know, I, I don't want to be a risk. That's the last thing I want. Um, and so I, I told him that I have to go. 
So I went and I tried to get more treatment. I, I told him, you know, I'll, I'll be back. There's no way this is that big of a deal. I'll, I'll be able to push through this. I'll be back. We'll be killing dudes again in no time. Um, but I get back up there and, and we start seeking more professional help. Realize like my nerve is, is definitely injured beyond repair for uh, the drugs that we had out there. Um, so two weeks later, again, um, so at this time now it's four weeks total in country without, uh, like surgical care or anything like that. I have to make the call again and say, I'm leaving country. Um, I'm going back to the States. I'm going to get better and I'm going to try to come back out here and join you guys. Um, so it was like April 1st is when I made it back to the States. Um, and then I got my first surgery on April 24th up at Walter Reed. So I had to do two weeks of mandatory um, quarantine because that's when COVID hit the earth, hit the world. <laughs> so uh, that was another struggle. It, it was uh, definitely interesting. I can't imagine what that was like too with the team, right? Where it's like, you just lost team commander, your team chief. And now, you know, you as an element leader, right? Someone who's in that position trying to step up and maintain continuity and trying to help or at least hang on to any shred of of uh, continuity for the team, right? Like you can't, right? You have to make that decision. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's tough, but I think it does make it a little easier too when you think about the risks involved. Uh, like I remember some people were asking me after I'd gone back, I was in a wheelchair, I was still paralyzed. Uh, but I was back working as a staff officer in the ops section. And they said, hey, you want to come out with a soda? And you can plan ops out in Afghanistan. And I was like, I'd love to be there with you. <laughs> like, you guys don't have to carry me around. Like, it's not, Afghanistan is not wheelchair friendly, right? It's not like, you know, like, no, I, I can't, right? Like, yeah. I just can't. So, um, but man, it's insane. And also, you know, two weeks of, COVID corn. So basically, you know, you're, you're dealing with this nerve issue now for seven or eight weeks before you get surgery. Yeah. I think it was six weeks, um, from point of impact to surgery. So I think that he waited the, the minimum amount of time, I guess, that you can operate on nerves from, uh, initial injury. So, gotcha. Yeah, and I didn't have the right drugs to help nerve pain either. So I was just taking narcotics and whatever else I could do to help numb the pain. And um, I, I tried my hardest. I didn't drink for the first, I think, four, five months of recovery. Um, so I wanted to get better as fast as I could. And I knew that that was just going to seriously jack things up it, for sure mentally but also physically in, in the recovery aspect yeah yeah and uh and so probably one of the biggest challenges you know i think for anybody in that situation um especially for me this is kind of the way i felt right like you come up in this culture where you're independent right and you're with your team so you're you're invincible almost right like you know you you're trained to, to, to accomplish any mission, do anything you want, right? Like you can, you can do anything. And you're also trained to, to build these bonds and stay with this team. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, in an instant you're helpless, right? Like you can't do anything. You can't walk, you can't move. Um, you're in pain and you're, you're removed from your team. Right. And, and trying to focus on things to, to move forward. So what you mentioned your mind state of, uh, focusing on recovery and trying to get back to the team and everything else. But obviously five months is a long time. And, you know, there was obviously a lot of other challenges along the way, but what, what were the things that anchored you or move, helped you maintain a positive mindset or, or, you know, get out of bed every day, right. To, to move forward during that time. It was really hard, man. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the motivation and determination that I had as a, a young Marine as a kid, like it, it never died. That fire was still lit inside of me. And, you know, I think even more so 
after the mission because I was so fired up about losing my teammates and then sitting there what ifing myself to death. Like, you know, what if I did this? What if I was only more prepared? What if I would have moved left instead of right? Blah, blah, blah. I did that to myself all day long, every single day. Um, but I would always go back to like my original mindset. It's like, why did I start this? Like, I'm, I, I know I can push past this. I've, I've been, I've been hurt before, maybe not like this, but I know, I know I can do this. And, you know, I, I just, I just tried to keep setting goals different goals every day and 90% of the time I wouldn't achieve the goals. I would get close and then I'd get another setback or I'd have to have another surgery or, you know, I want I so badly. I just wanted to be able to concentrate. I want to be able to read. I want to be able to help dudes like with training or setting this up. And I would just get knocked back down. It's like, well, what, I don't know how to keep myself motivated. I don't know how to keep pushing through this. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, I had to, I had to lean on my wife, my friends, you know, I, I couldn't do this by myself, not at this level. And yeah. I, there was days when I would sit there and I would just start crying out of nowhere. I would start, you know, just getting insanely irritated at the littlest things I would blow up on my family, you know, and I wanted to stay away from all the negative self-talk. I wanted to stay away from all the negative and just destructive ways that we normally cope with things. And at this point it was, you know, we're getting ready for one of the funerals and I, I broke down at the dinner table and I said, this is it. I need help can't do this on my own anymore. Um, and that's when I really started to, to seek outside help. And, you know, it actually started with just talking to my, my buddies about it. Like, that's honestly how I felt the most relief. Like I could get instant relief by just calling a friend and I was like, yo, I just need to vent. And I would talk, I would talk it over. I would talk to my wife. I talked to my dogs, <laughs> whatever I could do, you know, um, but yeah. I just had to keep setting small goals. I had to keep just doing something and getting those little victories that we always talk about. Like, I think that's one of the biggest things that kept me going. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't mentioned Hannah, your wife yet, but, you know, the story is, I understand it, right? She's, not only she's been there for you every step of the way, right? But you guys were just engaged when you had left, or you're just newly married, right? Right when you left, or you were engaged at that time? Just newly married. Okay. Yeah. So you're 28 years old, just newly married, on top of the world, Marine Special Operator, Element Leader, and Second Marine Raider Battalion, going back for his fifth pump, right? And, uh, this happens, right? And, you know, you have to deal with issues for mobility, but more importantly, the pain, right? Like nerve pain, you know, for those of you who may not understand it, it, it doesn't sound that bad, right? But it's like your your body's on fire, right? But, uh, you know, just uncontrollable, inconceivable, crippling pain, right? So, you know, so you mentioned you can't even focus on just read, right? Like you're just trying to read a book, you know, you can't do it. You can't do anything. Um, and dealing with that and struggling through that. And, and the goal thing I think is good, but the, the challenge that I experienced, which was tough, uh, I think, and what you kind of highlighted, right. Is like some of these things you, you set these goals and you have the best intentions, but you have no control, right? Like no control over the outcome. And so like, for me, it was like, Oh yeah, I want to get up and walk again. Right. And it was like, that's going to take me three years. Right. And it's like, now I'm on like nine years post injury now, right? So like, you know, the the goals can be good, but 
figuring out what's what's within your control and what's not right or or you know not letting those things sort of bog you down right or, or getting getting crushed by those just because you didn't reach it is is important to understand too especially with these types of like life-changing injuries or traumas right yeah um, but uh but yeah it's it's tough and it's it's awesome that you know that you had hannah and the dogs i, I also got a service dog after i'd gotten injured and um he was awesome right he was there for me all the time great dog his name's shaggy and um you know for me one of the biggest things was going out in town people stare at you because you're in a wheelchair right or you have you walk with a cane or whatever and they're like oh why is that you know young guy in a wheelchair why is he parking in a handicapped spot right or whatever but um shaggy was was good for me because immediately after they stare at me and zone in they just see a dog right and they'd stare at him you know mm -hmm. and so like that feeling of like everybody's staring at you, right. Or having eyes on you all the time or people like, you know, wondering what's going on, um, can be deflected. So that was, that was helpful for me as well. But, yeah. um, but yeah, it's, it's impressive. And, and, and I think also too, the important thing to think about is, uh, we're talking about this, like it happened like years or decades ago, right? This, this is recent. This is like 15 months ago, right. Or 16 months ago. This is not a long time ago. And so, I'm sure you you may not feel like it, but to get to where you are now and to have the recovery that you had is is a testament to to not only your your strength and work ethic, but also your family, um, and your support networks and your community and and obviously you've done something right, right? Like you're you're still here, you're still moving forward and and creating impact, right, for yourself and others, which is which is awesome. So yeah, it's commendable. Thank you, man. I I appreciate that. And I mean, like you know, it is every day is a challenge there's there's i don't think there's been an easy day yet um i keep asking like if it gets e any easier but i just you know i maybe in a way but it's all relative because it's like i now i just have new challenges because maybe i can move more but now i have this other pain that comes up and it's like when you're man when you're talking about nerve pain we are being very like calm about this particular pain but it is it's, it's i i can't even describe it because you never know how long it's going to last you never know like when it's going to come up if it's if it ever goes away it's it sucks <laughs> yeah um yeah yeah and i mean once you have these injuries right it's not it's usually not just one thing you know so uh unfortunately sometimes it's one thing leads to another which like really will beat you up and like drag you down. Right. So for me, I got a spinal cord injury and I'm injured, but then, you know, I have bladder management issues and then I have this other condition that I have random bones growing in my body that have to get surgically removed. And for you, right. It's like, okay, I got shot. Now I have nerve pain. Now there's, you know, drugs and surgeries and neuromodulation devices and infections and, you know, it's just like every time you feel like you take two steps forward, sometimes, you know, you get, you get just whacked back down. Right. And it's like, yeah. can be crippling, you know, can, can crush a resolve for sure. But, um, but I don't know what, what you think, but, but it sounds like, you know, the methods and the same mindset and the, the things you mentioned all help you, you know, pick yourself back up, right. And, and move forward. But what, what are like, what about that or what, what specifically helps you to do that? Or what do you do to, to maintain that mindset? So I really try, I really try to focus on more so on the present. I find that if I continue to what if things, if I continue to live in the past, if I continue to try to relive that mission, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to change the outcome. I can't change the outcome now. It's happened you know, living in the past is it it's very painful. And you know, setting goals, like I said, it, it is good, but stressing too much about the future and wondering if I'm ever gonna do this or if I'm ever gonna be normal again, you know, it also creates anxiety. So it's like I need a way for me to live right now. Because if I if I can't do that, I'm gonna focus on the pain, I'm gonna focus on everything else. Uh, I'm never going to be able to just sit there and be me. Um, 
So a lot of my, my, what helps me with my daily life is, is trying to live in the present. And my service dog helps me out a lot with that. Being able to interact with him, being able to do things like that. I, I meditate often. I try to, now that I can stretch and move my back a little bit, I'm starting to do yoga again. Um, you know, there, there's just so many different activities that you can do. I think one of the biggest things is taking time for yourself every day, whether that's sitting in a room alone, whether that's just sitting in your backyard or in your front yard and just existing, taking that time for yourself, taking a breath. Like you have to do it. If we just, if we try so hard and, and cram all these other minuscule tasks in and you're just going to work yourself to death. Like, you know, and if you ever start, I just, that's one of the other things is, is getting up and actually doing something like it's never going to happen if you don't start. So it's like, how am I going to get any better physically or mentally if I don't do something about it? And that's the other thing. Like, there's just nobody there that's going to be like, do this now. Like, here, here it all is. Like, just do it. It's like, no, it doesn't happen. Like, you physically have to make these things happen yourself. Like, that's it. It comes down to you. So. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. There's, there's uh, something comforting about taking action, right? doing something even if you know it's not perfect or or anything like that or if it's not guaranteed to work right just trying right like yeah. getting started doing something is there and um and uh it makes me think back to the conversation we had when we met a few months ago um uh, about starting right and like you know you'd reach out to me and you're like hey i have this idea i want to do this uh you're one of the first people i've talked to so i don't know everything but like can you help me and i was like hell yeah this is awesome. Let's do it. And so, uh, that was the beginnings of, you know, your idea for this nonprofit foundation called talents reach. And, um, and I think also too, the want to segue into that because the other thing that I've found, especially for people of similar backgrounds to us, uh, in general, and in general, not, not just the military, but anybody who's in a background where you are compelled by service or helping others, um, you can, use that as an opportunity to move forward. And so I just had another guest on, uh, and one of the things he said was, you know, when in doubt, focus out, right? And that's something we say in the military and it's saying, you know, if you're looking around at yourself, trying to figure out what to do or don't know where to get started, look outboard or, or outside, right? Outside of yourself and see what you can do to help others, right? And everything. So, so I'd love to, to hear more about Talon's Reach Foundation and your new mission. Yeah, man. So like you said, I, I had this idea and I didn't know where to start. I didn't really know anything about the, the business world, but I had this idea that I found a passion from sharing my story. I got the opportunity to go in front of a few people here and there and, and really open up and, and become vulnerable myself. Um, and this is when I started to conceptualize and, and realize, you know, like I've been a part of this stigma through the special operations community about mental health. And it's like, well, what happens when I do say I need help? What like am I going to be looked at as weak? Do my, do my teammates think that I'm weak right now? Do they think that, you know, I couldn't do this on my own? Like, you know, there's so many thoughts that go through your head about well, like this is it. I'm going to ask for help. My reputation's gone. Um, you know, and I, once I became vulnerable and I did it for the first time and I realized how many people were attracted to that, if that makes, if that's the right word, um, yeah. you know, they see somebody that has been through a life-changing experience that they didn't know had some feelings of, like this inside of them. And when you open up and you become honest and you tell them about the struggles that you've had and you tell them about the challenges, challenges that you've overcame and that you're still experiencing, like it's not only motivating to them, but it, it 
continues to motivate me every time that I talk about it because it makes me see where I've came from and where I'm going and and things of this nature. So I thought of this concept and um, we created Talents Reach Foundation to be able to provide a program for Special Operations Forces members, current and veterans, to be able to come and immerse themselves in outdoor recreational activities. Um, this way we can, you know, we can raise endorphin levels, dopamine, you know, we can get them on this, on this good feeling high out in the Montana mountains, um, get them doing things that they haven't done before, or they would like to do again, if they have some sort of physical injury, um, we can get adaptive sports guys out there. Uh, we have, we have the, the mountains as our playground and we're going to continue to do and refine things that will be able to be super uh, spiritual and like opening for, for guys. But we're also going to have that, that mental health twist to it, if you will. Um, it, it won't be therapy by any means. It's not treatment. We're not diagnosing anybody, but it'll be an opportunity for guys to build, to continue building that community within themselves, to be able to share their stories with each other, to go out, do these things together. They come back learn the methods of mindfulness, other holistic methods of healing, you know, sitting around a fire and talking about stories is, is healing in itself. And then introducing meditation and yoga and all that stuff afterwards to continue to calm that mind down and show us, you know, it's, it's okay to be calm. It's okay. Like you're still safe, but we're always so like we're, we're so used to living in that hypervigilant state. We don't understand that being calm is, is, is okay. And you're still, you know, able to react. And if not faster, if you actually take care of your mind. Um, so that'll be the concept of, of what we're going to do during the programs. The programs are going to be five days long, all expenses paid for the veteran or, or service member that comes through. Um, right now the main hub will be out in Montana. We'll have winter activities. We'll have summer activities. Um, I basically just say snow or no snow. What do you want? <laughs> and, you know, we, we haven't ran our first program, but as you mentioned, it's still early on in my recovery and we are going to use the two year mark of when I got injured as our first week for the program. Um, so it'll be March 7th through the 12th be able to do a five day long program and, and sum it up with a dinner at the end to kind of pitch our long-term view to pitch, you know, like show people, show the donors, this is what your money has gone to. These are the lives that you're changing. If not saving, like our ultimate goal, you know, is, is to be there for these guys. It's, it's to show them that they're not alone. We can do so much by reaching out to each other, by telling each other, like, it's okay, dude. Like there is people going through very similar things and you don't have to do it alone. Like yeah. we can do this together. We can reach in, we can grab each other. We can, you know, I just, there's, there's so much to, to having the guys. Um, it's, it's very healing. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. It's, uh, it seems simple, right? But, but I've seen some some of these instances where you know it, it you put the right ingredients together and it can be magical, right? Like it can be life altering, um, and you know all this stuff, right? Like on its surface, right? Like skiing or horseback riding, all these like these ex you know uh, activities uh, by themselves are not you know there's nothing magical about that. But it's, if you put the right people and the right chemistry and the right intentions. Uh, for the people that want to come and, and enjoy that or partake in that, that's truly, it could be truly impactful for a lot of people. And I'm really excited to see you, you succeed in doing that. Um, it's awesome. So you mentioned Montana, so North Carolina going to Montana. I, uh, I, I envy you a little bit. I'm not moving anytime soon because we're, we're locked down here in California and it's awesome, but I did watch all of Yellowstone and, um, you yeah. know, and it's pretty awesome. So, oh, yeah. uh, excited for you guys and uh maybe come visit you soon there and um and it's awesome it's been a whirlwind and i, I can't you know 
stress enough, like the, the timeline, right? Like you've set your mind to do this. You've set your intent to do this. The timeline is ridiculous, right? Like you were in Iraq conducting special operations, had a life changing injury less than 15 months ago, packed up, moved. We didn't even, you're back in North Carolina. Now you moved to Montana. We didn't even talk about this. I want to talk about it as well. But, but last week, you know, you were awarded the nation's second highest award for, for bravery and for valor, the Navy cross. Um, and you had some really interesting things to say about that and, and, you know, and, and provide some perspective on that. Um, and that's why you're in North Carolina now before you head back to Montana and, and continue pushing forward, but truly a whirlwind and an amazing ride that you've been on and, uh, really excited to see all the success that you'll have moving forward, uh, with Talons Reach Foundation and in your new mission, helping people, you know, to create these communities, create these networks and, and to create the awareness that you're looking to accomplish. So. So yeah, so that's, it's awesome. Um, Navy cross ceremony. So we talked a lot about the event that, that happened, but we didn't really highlight, or I didn't pin you down and, you know, make you feel uncomfortable for talking about how, uh, heroic and brave, you know, all members of the team were at that, that event, but especially you as taking charge and stepping up as the, the, you know, the element leader to, to conduct those activities. Um, and so if you read the citation, we'll post a link to the citation, but if you read the citation, it, it details just a snapshot of, of the things that, that Nick did on that day. And, you know, and the, the reality is that because of his actions and the men and his team's actions and his partners, you know, they were able to not only re recover the bodies of, of the Marines there, but also save, uh, potentially save the lives of, of some of their, uh, counterparts some of the nato counterparts i believe it was a french soft guy right who you were working with there um and so that uh you know, no, nobody likes to talk about themselves nobody sees themselves as the hero right but but uh you were recently recognized for that and i do want to recognize you as well for that you know it was a similar instance in my situation a little bit because unfortunately you know myself and my teammate weren't killed but we had a small number of people and uh when our Assistant Patrol Leader Brian Jacklin stepped up and and led the efforts along with our teammates. Was awarded the same award as well, the Navy Cross. Um, and he said the same thing. You know, he said very similar things about, you know, this is just a small representation of of what the team accomplished, right? Um, and so, love to hear your thoughts. And and you guys can see it on video and online and different things about. I think the speech is probably um, still online, or there's images and other videos and things. But but love to hear just a quick short perspective of of what that day meant for you and, and the award and, and how you view it and, and, and those sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for those words. I mean, it, I do really appreciate it. And it is, uh, when people approach me about it and they say, congratulations, you know, a lot of, most people follow that up with like, it's, it's a hard thing to congratulate somebody for must feel weird on your end and um you know it is it's definitely bittersweet there's things that i said in in the speech that i gave where i do feel like a failure i feel like you know i mean it, the medal reminds me of when i lost my teammates it to me it it doesn't resemble you know a prestigious award that you get for graduating high school or or uh, college or grad school or what, whatever it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's something for me to remember one of the worst days of my life. But with that, it's also such an iconic piece of military history. I mean, these instances are what we read about, what we study, what we hear about. And it's like, these are the things that breed young men like myself, young men and women to join the military, to aspire themselves to work harder. Like this award is so much bigger than myself. It's so much bigger. It's, it's at this point, it's not even for me anymore. Um, it's an ability for me to be able to use these experiences that I encountered to teach, inspire, and to drive people to bigger and better things. Um, you know, we always say, 
or at least for something of this level, it's like I would totally give this award back any day to have those guys back. But I'm also not going to let this go to waste. I'm not going to accept this award and go sit quietly. I I feel that at this point in in my life, I I have a voice. I have an ability to use this to change the lives of so many people. And, you know, I, there's still a lot of work that I need to do for myself along the way. Um, but I'm not going to stop. Just like what I said before, you know, it's like they, won't, they wouldn't quit on me. I'm not going to quit on them still. I'm not going to quit on everybody else out there. You know, I, I truly, I want to change, I want to change the way soft approaches mental health. I want to change the way that we work. I want to, I, I want to change the world. So. It's awesome. Yeah. It's powerful, man. Yeah. And, and to a man, I think everybody I've met who's been awarded the Navy cross and even some medal honor recipients who are still uh, alive, whether you like it or not, right. You, you get thrust into this platform, right. And, People will know you. They will know about you. Uh, and so what better way to use that than to accomplish change that you care about and that you're passionate about and help others, right? And so good on you, man. It's uh, it's inspiring to see. And um, and you're right. Like none of us want to be on social media all the time or, you know, doing these sorts of things, but that's where people are, right? And so if, if you have the opportunity to tell stories like we're doing right now and inspire others or, or help people if this is going to help people, you know, then great. Right. Like that's, that's a win. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, very mature and, you know, profound way of thinking of things. And so I'm excited to see you, you move forward and to, to honor the legacies of, of, you know, Mo and Diego by, you know, taking advantage of every day and, and helping so many other people. So, um, it's awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time. We're going on two hours now. This is amazing. I could talk to you for, for weeks at a time, probably, uh, jaw jacking, but, uh, we'll cut it here. Um, and so again, just to summarize, this is an episode of forward with Dara Carrera and Nick Jones. Uh, Nick Jones is the founder of Talons Reach Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, designed to help special operations veterans with psychological, mental, emotional well-being through outdoor activities. And then you can find them online, on Instagram, on their website. I'll let you you do that, Nick, so I don't butcher it. But where, where, can, where can people find you? So talonsreachfoundation.org is our website. From there, you can go down to our, our handles if you need um, social media platforms. On Instagram, it's just Talons Reach Foundation. Facebook, it should be Talons Reach Foundation. Um, and then on the website, you can also get involved. If you go to um, the links there, you can click on team. You can click on volunteer. We got forms for that. There's also now application forms for um participants to go through the program. So if you or yourself are interested in being a volunteer or you know somebody who would be interested in being a volunteer or going through the program, um, fill out the applications, email me, call me. Um, all the information is there that's provided. So, Hell yeah. And also you can donate too. So that uh, too. you didn't mention that. I'll mention that for you. Um, Running these endeavors takes effort and money, right? And uh, and I can tell you, running small nonprofits is incredibly challenging. And uh, this one literally it just started. So any support you may be able to provide if you're so inclined or considering donating your time, talent, or treasure, um, getting involved or or financially, you can do that on on their website. So uh, definitely give it a look, and and you know. Again, if you're so inclined, you know, donate. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, uh, this is incredible. Thank you for your time. I can't thank you enough. And uh, 
hope you and and Hannah and uh, what's your dog's name? Fletcher. Yeah, Fletcher's my service dog, and then I got Smokey and Teddy. Oh, nice. Are they all? They're all with you in North Carolina right now. Fletcher's here with me. Smokey and Teddy are are living the big life oh, okay. in Montana. All right. Well, in that case, then hope you, uh, Hannah and Fletcher, have a safe trip home back to Montana, and um, look forward to to seeing great things about Talons Reach Foundation. And thank you again so much for your time. Thank you, Derek. It's been a pleasure being here. I appreciate it.